Patrick Mangan on Citizens for Community Media. You may recognize Patrick from, uh, we've had two shows already. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the title on this show is Trump Nation. Um, the first show we had was before the election, and right. we had one right after the election. Mm -hmm. And now it's been maybe, I don't know, 110 days. Right. Okay. Right. And you've been following it really close because um, I remember going to the Heritage Foundation meeting and I knew you were warming up to uh, Ted Cruz mm -hmm. and Trump and then you decided that you wanted to back Trump. This is quite a while before the election. Oh, right, right. Okay, right. maybe, I don't know, it was a year before or yeah, whatever. a year and a half maybe. Yeah. yeah. And because you, you believe, you know, as a Christian that we should be involved. Yes. Okay. Yes. I mean, as a Christian, we've read it before, you know, First Timothy, that we're, but first of all, before all things, you're supposed to pray mm -hmm. for those in authority and especially for kings. Right. So it's, it's a strong duty for a Christian to at least pray. Now, the question is, what's the duty after you pray? I would assume mm -hmm. that there would be some responsibility to, to jump, to, to follow through on the prayer. Yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think, you know, the Apostle Paul is a great example. Um, he used his Roman citizenship to appeal to Caesar uh, when he was unjustly beaten for his faith, not because he was worried about the injustice, but because it was an avenue that carried him from a remote province in Judea all the way to giving testimony uh, to Caesar in Rome. So uh, a skillful believer is going to use their citizenship uh, and steward it the appropriate way and honor God with that. And we also have the example in the Old Testament uh, of Joseph and Daniel who really were prime ministers to pagan nations. And because of them, because of their faith, particularly because of their uh, government involvement, you might even say political service, uh, they were able to bring life, wisdom, and a revelation of God to that whole nation. So. Uh, I think we have an obligation not only to pray for the leaders. Uh, prayer always leads to action. Prayer isn't just something that happens um, in a closet. When you pray, you get drawn in. You know, when, uh, when I pastored a church, uh, we started on Sunday mornings at 7 a.m. And when you're, when you're a ministry family, Sunday's a long day to start with. And uh, we prayed for several years, maybe as much as seven years, at 7 a.m. every Sunday morning for all three branches of government and all three levels of government. And at that time, we uh, had no bigger designs on anything. We just wanted to see righteousness reign in the government the way the founders uh, dedicated the country. And so, you know, that led to engagement and that led to engagement in elections and helping find the right people to run, asking them to run, helping them through primaries, helping them get into office and then pastoring them, counseling them, sometimes uh, challenging them on their decisions, and sometimes, you know, uh, taking a call from somebody who wanted to run something past. And that started off locally and became regional and state until now there are multiple people in Washington, um, you know, who are personal friends and who we pray with and who we talk with and, uh, and we offer advice to and sometimes um, uh, exhort uh, on, on consistency with their stated positions and, and work with them. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy to have been a friend of Mike Pence's before he was governor and, um, and I'm happy to know the vice president now as a godly man in the White House. And um, I'm happy to have played a role in you know, running the Trump campaign here and meeting him um, on the night that we delivered Indiana in a decisive way. And that ended um, really all the challenges at that point to uh, the uh, Trump uh, primary uh, challengers. And, uh, and, and now, you know, we've crossed the finish line and all of the, um, all the challenges, all the criticisms, all the cheap shots, all the comparisons like they did to Reagan. He's an actor. What's he know about being president? You know, he, he, has a, he has a, you know, he's a TV personality. What's he know about being president? And we saw the same treatment of Reagan. And we're, we're watching something unfold right now, which is that Donald Trump, um, he was underestimated by 
all of those who ran against him on the Republican side, and he was underestimated uh, by the left, and they kept trying to demonize him. But he has come in with a fury and is changing America every day, and in, in a positive way. Now, uh, uh, just for the audience, we know each other from Notre Dame. Yeah. I actually campus crusade for Christ back yeah. in the 70s, and your daughter graduated from Notre Dame. Yes. And Pence is going to be speaking. Yes. Very yes. shortly. At the, as the, at the commencement. Yes, yes. Um, are you going to be meeting Pence? I mean, you, <laughs> I, mean uh, I, 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 I wouldn't say, but I, but I would say, I would say this: that I think, uh, I think Mike Pence is an extraordinary gentleman. I think he is one of the best voices um, on the right. Um, we haven't always agreed on every decision that that he's made, but I can tell you. Um, you know, when he came into the governor's mansion and when we, uh, you know, we, we gathered with his staff and, and dedicated, you know, his time in office and dedicated um, their efforts right around the great seal of the state of Indiana and the carpet there in the governor's office. So the thing I can tell you is, is that those who have um, criticized uh, Mike's coming is extraordinary to me um, how... Uh, how weak sometimes this present generation is. Um, I grew up in an Irish home, so we debated politics and religion all the time. So uh, for, uh, for me to know Mike and know the kind of gentleman that he is, and um, he, he, is, he literally is a perfect gentleman. And to have students come out and say uh, they're afraid because Mike Pence is coming in, my, my reaction to that as a Notre Dame alumnus is, is that um, Oh my, you know, if this makes you frightened and, you know, you need comfort dogs and counseling, you know, over the election, then you're going to live in a very small world that is constructed by your own narcissism and by the fact that you have picked up an anti-conservative, anti-Christian, anti-pro-family value bigotry. And, I mean, if Mike Pence sets you ill at ease and, and gives you tremors, uh, and you've got a very small world you're going to have to crawl into because they, you know, we talked about Trump Nation. I think there's a graphic they're going to put up um, that shows what the representative election means geographically, county by county across the United States. And it's a stunning map. Um, it, it, it tells a completely different story than what the media have told. Well, I think it said uh, Hillary Clinton won 57 counties and Trump won 3,000, yeah, yeah, the county, the, the counties of population are, are amazing. I mean, when you look at this map, what you're looking at is a thin strip of uh, blue dots down the eastern seaboard, another thin strip. Uh, down the Mississippi Valley and, and uh, a few up north there in Minnesota and in Wisconsin. And then you see a, a, a little another little strip out in the desert, another one over on the west coast. In the rest of the country, probably a good 80-some percent or more of the, of the actual area of the country is represented by conservative voters I who voted not, more than that, 90 voted for, for Donald Trump. And, and what we're seeing is not only a culture conflict, but we're seeing the difference between a handful of people who are concentrated in cities who want everything handed to them versus the urban or versus the suburban and uh, the rural areas of America who want conservative leadership, who want less government, who want the government to keep the peace and to stay out of their business. And that is a that is a a bigger archetype than, you know, Republicans and Democrats. You know, Ted Cruz. One of the things he said in in his launch of a campaign, I thought was really insightful. He said the differences between uh, the Democratic establishment and the Republican establishment are far less than the differences between the American people and both parties in Washington. And and I I think I think that insight um, proved true. And I think it continues to be true. Uh, you know, the, America is delighted with the motions we're taking now to walk completely away from what Obama did. Obama went so far off the left that he took us off the page. And now we're seeing a sharp turn to the right, but it'll be a long way before we even get back to center 
much less to the right. So, you know, I, I think it's important for us to understand that, um, yes, there's a division in the nation, um, but it, it wasn't the Russians. Even all the people who supported Obama who said, well, it was the Russians who gave the election, it was coming. No, uh, all of them said there isn't one vote that was changed by what Russia did. Not, not a single vote. They didn't get into any voting machines. There's no evidence of that anywhere. Not even all of the Obama cronies would dare say that because it, be it would be a complete lie. And they know it. So uh, it, it wasn't the Russians. Um, it, it wasn't uh, that, that uh, uh, Comey's uncomfortable handling of all the accusations with everybody. You know, it wasn't that. It was that the American people stood up and said, we want our country back. And we don't want to be a socialism, and we don't like the leftist way that, uh, that Barack Obama led this country uh, deeper into embracing uh, abortion, embracing uh, sexual infidelity and uh, aberrant sexual practices, and deeper into uh, retreating from our friends in the world, cozying up to our enemies in the world, mm -hmm. uh, embracing radical Islam while radical Islam has declared war on America. And uh, the American people stood up and said, we want our country back. And we want the government off of our backs. We don't want the debts. We don't want Obamacare. We want the wall. We want to have real borders. And we want the nation that we had before this malaise you know, took over the country. And I, and I think that's a different message. And it's clearly seen in the graphic. Um, you know, you could take... Uh, you could take all the blue across the whole country and stick it inside California and it still wouldn't cover up California. No, it's, it's like 90%. Yeah. Now, there is this kind of like, I think Rush Limbaugh said, a lot mm -hmm. of people said it, there is this kind of civil war. Um, I was at uh, the Lang Lab there and mm -hmm. they had a bunch of IUSB professors sitting at, they had a little bar there. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to the guy that I know there. I said, well, hey, you know, what were you guys talking about? So he said, well, they're talking about in the classes mm -hmm. They're trying to figure out how to get the kids to talk to each other because of this yeah. political divide. You know, they're on one side or the other, and people can't talk. You know, uh, how, where do you think that's at? I mean, well, you know, you're you on know Facebook. I'm, you, I don't. You, you there is this. When 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 we were in college, um, we got into philosophy classes, we got into literature classes, we got into theology classes, and we debated. Um, and you know, in those days, one of the things that we did. Um, at one particular professor, we, we had it was an all discussion course, right? You read all these different authors and discuss. And one of his rules was, before you counter the person who you know just said something, you have to repeat to their satisfaction what their position actually is. Right, you have to so do a little. So you listening. have to listen. You have to you have to think through. Okay, how how are they thinking about this? Then you can make an intelligent comment back. Today, what everybody's doing is talking past each other. But there's something that's very different about the right from the left. And this is what they found just recently. And this is one of the things that Rush was talking about. Uh, most conservatives have friends who voted uh, on the opposite side. They still maintain those friendships. They, they maintain those friendships. They didn't cut off their family. They didn't cut everybody off of Facebook. They didn't do that. The liberal side of this has no conservative friends. They, they didn't have one friend who voted for Trump. And if they did, they cut them off. Cut them off on Facebook. Cut them off. Cut them off. Cut them off. So they, they can't tolerate listening to their position. Yeah, we can no longer tolerate the intolerance of the so-called tolerance movement. I mean, uh, the idea is that we have a clash of ideas. It's a clash of ideas that birthed the nation. Uh, there was great debate before they took the step to break from England. And there were extensive debates, but the purpose of those debates was to clarify the issue clarify the positions and give confidence once you move forward. Once you uh, stop reaching out across the divide, uh, then there, there's only one source for the wisdom. You know, what I found in, in all of my uh, friendships and relationships, and I do have friends who are liberals, and I do have friends, you know, uh, who disagree with the positions I take and disagree with the positions Donald Trump takes. And I disagreed with almost everything that Barack Obama did. I mean, almost everything, but I didn't hate him. As a Christian, we can't. Like we what, cannot I did him. not like what he did, and I didn't like the direction of the country. And, and for those eight years, I, you know, 
I felt like an exile in my own country because I didn't feel like uh, Barack Obama represented me as a blue collar kid who came up through, went to school and worked hard. I didn't feel like he had anything to say to me on that. I didn't think he had anything to say to me as a Christian. I didn't think he had anything to say to me um, as somebody who wants less government and, and wants um, a balance of the budget. Um, and, I, and I thought he was a hypocrite from the start to the end because he, he attacked Bush for spending you know, the money on the war on terror. And then he double spent him and spent more than every other president in history and left us with a you know, $20 trillion you know, tag that's going to be affecting my kids and my children's kids. But your conservative Christian position, first of all, it doesn't allow you to, or it says in Scripture, speak evil of the ruler of the people. I, I'm, not, I'm not able, I'm not able, um, I, we're, I don't think any of us are called to commit sedition or uh, the undermining. I criticized openly many of the things this president, this past president did. And, uh, and, I, and I would say everybody has a right to criticize. You know, I, I have been on, um, I've taken on the most controversial uh, topics in the culture, uh, you know, sexual issues, premarital sex, sexual education, uh, abortion, um, homosexuality, pornography, all of these issues. And we've brought coalitions together and we've had an exchange with those on the opposite side of our positions that have caused many of them to say, you know, I completely disagree with what you're saying, but I really appreciate the way you've discussed it. You know? Civilly. Yeah, we, well, civilly. And, you know, when we took on the homosexual issue. We said, you know, our standard, we, we called the standard lovingly opposing the homosexual agenda. We don't uh, we're not against anybody who's struggling with same-sex attraction. I've been ministering to homosexuals, bringing them out of homosexuality for 40 years. So we love everybody, but we can disagree. And one, one time a reporter asked me and said, well, how can it be love if you say no? If you're saying no. <laughs> and I said, are you, are, you, I said, are you serious? Do you really want me to answer? It was in a press conference. And I said, listen. I said, do you love your kids? Did you ever say no to them? No, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing so, reports of people spoiling their kids. Like I just talked to some 19-year-old local boy that, well, he's destroyed. They spoiled him. He's yeah. destroyed. We, we, we're, in a, we're in a time when we have to be able to have substantive discussions. Listen, there are, um, there are more issues than one, two, or three issues. There's a good 10 or 12 that are critical for the world. You know, I, I at least try to think about you know, where Donald Trump's at in the sense of what's his foreign policy, what's his domestic policy. And so, you know, uh, people have asked me, OK, um, and by the way, bef before Donald Trump was elected, some of my friends, some of my conservative friends said, I guarantee you that, you know, if you get Donald Trump elected in the first six months, he's going to do something that just, you know, really, uh, you know, makes you cringe. And I said, he'll probably do that in the first six weeks. I said, I'm not surprised at that. I'm not electing a god. I'm electing a president with clay feet like every other one that's been elected. But I do see in Donald Trump the seeds of what founded the nation, the seeds of what fought to protect the nation, the seeds of what has always made America stand taller. And one of the things I see is like, for example, in foreign policy and the mockery that was laid at Donald Trump's feet during the election and even afterwards and through you know, uh, his coming into office was extraordinary. But this is what I want to tell you. The Trump effect is having the same thing as the Reagan effect. When Reagan found that, uh, you know, Colonel Gaddafi, you know, had a stake uh, in the Lockerbie bombing in Scotland of the airliner, he sent the F-16s, they dropped smart bombs down his chimney. Gaddafi went underground for like 18 years. Oh, yeah. And then people said, well, Reagan's a cowboy, he's crazy. And that worked to our advantage with our, those who want to be an adversary of freedom in the world because they thought, well, we have to calculate differently now because you don't know what Reagan's going to do. He's, he, he'll, they have the military and he'll use it. So what did Trump do? We get into this whole thing in Syria and whether you know, anybody can police all the facts and figure out all the things. There's been so many stories about what and did and didn't. The whole point was that Barack Obama told him, if you use chemical weapons against your people, there's a red line, we're gonna, and he did nothing. And our friends lost confidence in, in our resolve. In 2013. Yeah, our friends lost confidence in our resolve. 
Our adversaries lost respect for our resolve. And so the first thing that Donald Trump does with great military advisors is drop 59 Tomahawk missiles. It's a great, perfect military strategic objective. They told the Russians, uh, you know, an hour in advance, get your people out of the way because we're not aimed at you. So we're not going to start World War III in a surrogate war with Russia. They dropped those on. They didn't blow up the runway. They blew up all their planes. Hundreds of millions of dollars of that that came from where? Russia. What was Russia doing? Russia was blowing up uh, our friends in Syria, wherever that, however far you can go with that term. And so it made Russia completely recalculate where they had been allowed to come in and become a major player in the Middle East. You know, uh, Trump showed them right away. Uh, we, no, we don't want to police the world. We didn't send 100,000 troops, but we can get you wherever you are. And if you go to this point, if you're going to go that far outside the Geneva Convention, everywhere else, um, you know, we can, we can get to you and we're going to do it. Well, that immediately sent the message to whom? It sent the message to Iran. You better watch it. It sent the message uh, to North Korea. You better watch it. It completely reset things with China. He told him over well, dinner. It, it, happened do that. When, it happened when he was doing it on dinner. Right. But, but what, then, then what's that? How did that affect China? Look, we've had 20 years of presidents trying to get China to acknowledge currency manipulation and the trade deficit and all these things. And they just stonewall us and, you know, they, they won't do it. You know, it, it, the premier of China was responding to Trump on the campaign before he was elected. So now what's happened is we've seen China for the first time get pulled in a major way to, to, to put North Korea in their spot. They ran the troops up to the border with North Korea. Um, they also turned away shipments of coal from North Korea. Their only trading partner is really China. And they took our coal instead as a sign to uh, North Korea that, you know, you better watch what you're doing because we're not going to back you with this. And so immediately the so-called, you know, uh, TV personality who didn't have any capacity and who didn't have any gravitas has done what the last 20 years of presence wasn't able to do, which is bring China to the table as a partner. And this is the effect of the art of the deal. And the art of the deal is pretty simple. You know, you reach for more than you're ever going to get so that you can give something back. It's, it's like a, it's like a perfect, it's like a perfect strategy for China because they have to save face. You give something back, you weren't going to get anyway, so you get what you need. And that's what Trump has been doing. Now, in the immediate time, you know, there's all this hyperbole. Oh, he's going to start World War III. It's the same things. It's the tired old 20, 30-year-old stuff that they were throwing at Reagan. But what happened? Reagan set up the collapse of the Soviet Union and the collapse of that wall because the resolve was there to act. One of the things that um, has been a bit of a controversy was Donald Trump's actions. And so he said, I don't think we should go into Syria. He didn't think we should go into Iraq well, either. Just, just for the, the audience, you know, I was uh, strongly opposing you, th yeah. that position. Sure. You know, and, and in fact, you were strongly opposing taking action. Oh, yeah. I strongly opposing so, uh, that the idea that that I do, I do not believe Assad did that. I mean, yeah. we have a difference yeah, yeah. of opinion, and I do believe um, that Trump, in a sense, invaded. Syria. I mean, this is, there's a difference here on this. Yeah, you know? I, I know we have a difference, and I know others have a difference so, on this. You know, so I'm really upset that that happened because I don't believe the ends justifies the some of the some of the people who supported means. Donald Trump, um, uh, you know, were were taken aback because they said, well, "Wait a minute, is he reversing everything he said?" And and here's the thing, no, but, but, he, but I got to have patience you know, to see this work out. But I'm really upset. Yeah, that he, that happened. he's not because he did a laser strike. And er, a lot of people have have um, raised the question: Why not just send one? Why send 59? Why send all these missiles? And the reason is simple: um, Russia put in radar detection uh, for Syria. When you send 59, it overwhelms that system. Well, it was, it was, didn't even get it, was it was a perfect it was a perfect tactical use. It was limited. It didn't uh, it it didn't evoke a war with Russia, but it set them on notice. We're not letting you do what you've been doing. And so what it did, though, is it reset it for everybody around the world. And it was restrained. And uh, Trump has repeated the fact that we're, we're not, we're not going to invade that. We don't, we don't want that. 
you know, but we are, we are going to at least say, hey, if you're going to bully your citizens to that point, we're going to, we're going to stop you on that. We're going to give you, and you know what, if you keep doing it, next time we'll blow up the whole runway. And the next time, maybe we'll take on, you know, the presidential palace. I mean, we'll go as far as we need to, but it's a very limited kind of response. And it got the attention of the world. And it said to everybody, hey, America is back in the driver's seat. Look, we didn't set up an imperialistic, you know, kingdom. We don't have little uh, fiefdoms all around the world that we, you know, own. When, uh, you know, when uh, General Colin Powell was challenged about America's imperialism and how they go around taking over the world, he said, hey, the only, the only ground we have ever required is enough ground to bury the men for those white crosses you see in every place that we have fought for to give them their country back and to set them free. And that is the, the reality of America. That's America. That's Reagan's America. That's Washington's America. You know, that's the America uh, that... In the past century, everybody thought if America goes good, it'll be good for the world. Now we're in this time where um, it's, it's very confused and we're having to deal with other issues. Like, for example, on the foreign policy side, which ties into the domestic policy, is the whole issue of immigration. You know, um, every rally I went to, we said, build the wall. And, and everybody is still saying that who supported Trump, build the wall. Well, don't you like people? Don't you? No, we love people. You know, just like just like Donald Trump said, hey, put a big door in the middle of it. But we're going to do it fair and right. And we are going to have a border. You are going to respect it. Just the fact that they started enforcing the laws that are on the books. No new laws. It slowed it down. It slowed it down by like 40 percent to 60 percent. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this idea that um, everybody in the world has a right uh, to what Americans have is absolutely wrong. We're not a world community. We're a community of nations, separate states, separate independent nations. Uh, we are generous in this country. You know, uh, when, when my great, great, great grandfather left Liverpool and uh, came from Ireland and uh, landed in the Philadelphia Harbor on a ship called the Abbotsford, um, our family uh, spent two generations in coal mines and two generations in factory before one of us got to college. So, you know, you're, you're not entitled to uh, sneak in uh, and then be treated as somebody who's uh, entitled to a safety net because you snuck in. That's not the way my family got here. That's not the way most of the immigrant families that I know, they came through Ellis Island or they came through a legitimate process where they came. Um, one, of the, one of the most insightful interviews on this was given by Melania. Uh, they got her and thought, you know, because, you know, she speaks with a, a, a certain accent and doesn't seem to flow with the language like they would put her on the spot. And they said, well, don't you think that, uh, you know, your husband's a hypocrite because, I mean, you know, you're from another country. And she looked back at them and very politely and very firmly said, yes, I am. I am an immigrant, but I did it legally. And I got a green card and then I flew back and I and she went through and she enumerated all the steps she went through to legally for years to legally immigrate to the United States. That's the kind of immigration we want. You know, we've got a situation on the southern border that's not only a danger for every American because our enemies use that porous border mm -hmm. to slip in. We've caught uh, ISIS and Al Qaeda and everybody trying to get through that border and the great hypocrisy in this, you know, for um, some of the uh, violent activists, which I don't think represent uh, the Hispanic people, because the Hispanic people in the country are growing in their support for Donald Trump. Yeah, just the, went, yeah, just went way up. Yeah. yeah, and the ones who are here legally, you know, uh, they're saying we want that. We 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 want people to have to come here legally. We don't want the drug cartels. No. Coming across the no, border, we they, don't they do want have a that. Strong sit. family, like even where I live, there's a lot of Mexicans. You know, they, they, so so you family. know, this hasn't gotten done in Congress yet, right? That's going to be the big test. It, the the uh, you know the executive order's been done, and I want to I want to say that Donald Trump deserves a lot of credit because he's taking controversial things and he's putting in an executive order now, right at the start. Not what presidents do when they're in the last quarter of their presidency 
and do a bunch of conservative or do a bunch of controversial executive orders and then run out of town. He's doing it right at the front end. So, you know, the great hypocrisy is that guess who built a wall? Mexico. We're at on their southern border. Why? To keep out the Guatemalans. So, you know, this is total um, hypocrisy. Uh, and then you get to what do we do about, uh, you know, these so-called sanctuary cities, which are lawless. Well, Texas governor just... Uh, yeah, the Texas that's governor... That's going to be challenged probably in the courts, I mean. It'll be challenged in the courts, but the Texas governor said we outlaw. We're not doing that. And I believe uh, that uh, we don't... You can't say... Uh, we've declared ourselves to be Sparta. You know, uh, you know we're, we're our own city-state in Chicago. We're our own city-state in Los Angeles. We're our own city-state, you know. Uh, that, that's not the way America works. No, I mean, the, the Southerners tried no. that in the Civil War. It didn't work. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's, that's what it starts to imply. It's like anybody who does that says, I'm not respecting the outcome of the election. You know, the, the left was screaming how... You know, uh, gee, would, uh, you know, Trump people were going to riot and all this. And, you know, you remember the last time the, the, the conservatives lost to Barack Obama twice and how they burned down the country? No, it never happened. Probably, that's, probably that is because not the way the Probably right because there's a strong Christian element, more of a Christian element, perhaps. And I'm not trying to yeah. claim that restrains that. That well, restrains I, that, right? Yeah, and, and, and there's also a respect for different views and a respect for the fact that we can debate and we can argue, we can fight, you know, uh, verbally over uh, any policy we have. You know, I've never tried to silence the opposition, but there have been um, at least 12 times in Indiana when the opposition on homosexuality has tried to criminalize faith speech mm -hmm. as hate speech mm -hmm. and so words, keep, you can't you just can't even gently tell them what the bible says it, it, it doesn't it, it doesn't matter how lovingly how sweetly how nicely how it doesn't matter if if you know one of my one of my friends who's a pastor he's a african-american pastor here in town uh he came and spoke at one of the council meetings and, and he said i'm not the cook he said i didn't cook this this is what god cooked and he said i i am held to serve what God has prepared. And what God has prepared is this is wrong. And I love everybody who struggles with it and I'll help them out of it. But you can't tell me that I have to go along with this. Look, there, there are, there are, we hear a lot of people talking about human rights. Let me tell you what the first human right is. The right to life, the right to be born, the right to not be murdered in the womb. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's the second one? The second human right is the right to conscientious objection. That is that you are not going to be forced to subjugate your conscience to this. So, you know, if a conservative, um, you know, doesn't like guns, they don't buy one. If they if they if they don't like um, a, a particular brand of television, they don't watch it. You know, but when a liberal says they 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 don't like guns, they they want to take guns away from everybody. If if a liberal doesn't like something that somebody says they disagree with, they try to take them off the air. So this is not the way you build forward. And I, and I think right now um, the, the Democrats as a surrogate for the left have been losing state elections in state houses and state senates and governor's races for probably at least 10 years now in a decisive way. They've lost the Congress, they, they've lost both houses, they have lost the presidency, and they're not listening. They keep trying to say it's it. Um, I, I, I call the, the kind of discussion that we're having these days is sort of like the Bermuda Triangle in marriage. It's when she says, you don't understand, and he says, I understand, but I disagree. And she says, if you understood, you'd agree. And, and, <laughs> and we're kind of at, at, at this impossible place um, where uh, we don't agree with each other's positions. We now, because we have not a, an objective media um, that is uh, objectively analyzing, but we have a media that is almost 100% yellow journalists. Look, I started as a journalist. I trained as a journalist. I practiced as a journalist. And the one thing you were never allowed to do was come to the table with an opinion, advocate that p opinion, and 
and pretend that you were an objective observer journalist. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to do that, you did that in editorials. And mm -hmm. you declared yourself, I have an opinion, and now I'm going to declare my opinion. But what's happened now is all the news is advocacy. Well, it's subtle because you're hired, you're a hired hand, and you know what pleases the people that pay you. And, you, and even, if it's, even if they try to be, you, you kind of know what's going to get you promoted. You, you, you well, say things that please it, your boss. It, it, it is more, it's more than that because when I started, there were a lot of conservative editorial pages or pages that were balanced and, and or you had a, a liberal ownership and you still had conservative pages or you had conservative ownership and you had liberal news reporting. And, it, and you didn't touch the news process. You left it there. It was interesting. I was watching an interview with uh, Ted Koppel the other night. And they were talking to him because, you know, he, he was such a uh, towering journalist in his time, especially in his heyday, which, you know. He always seemed very objective in yeah, his heyday. Yeah, he, 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 he was very objective. He wasn't very emotional. He would take both sides. And, um, and, and you, kind of, uh, you kind of had the sense of trust that Walter Cronkite had before he weighed in with his own opinion, you know, on the war in Vietnam. And so he was saying, he, you know, uh, Tavis Smiley was the one who was, uh, uh, you know, uh, interviewing him. And he said, well, is there more of that? And he said, there, there, there isn't any objective journalism anymore. And he said, we need a lot more of that because the country's divided. And um, if you continue to just back one side and not listen and not process, you're going to end up with a completely divided nation. And that is, um, that is where, we, where we are and right now, uh, it's the conservatives' turn. It is the right's turn to, uh, you know, get the cabinet appointed. Why are the Democrats, they have held more people from Donald Trump out than any president in history. And, and then they'll turn around and say he doesn't have the rest of his appointments made. Well, you've got to put your, your top team together, and then they participate in that process. So it's this, like, kind of game and anybody who's inside and who understands how government works and understands what's going to happen goes, now nah, you guys don't get away with that. You're causing the problem you're complaining that's there. So you don't get to do that. And that's the place where we have come. In spite of all of that, Donald Trump has uh, been able to accomplish a good bit of his agenda um, in foreign policy. And the wall will be built. Somebody's going to pay for it. Mexico may pay for it. There, there may be user fees that pay for it. It may be the drug cartel that pays for it. You know, uh, Ted Cruz said, hey, let's have, let's have the, uh, the drug dealers pay for it that we arrest. Well, it's it's going to get built, and it has to be built. And we have to have a legitimate um, immigration process. There is no legitimate immigration process. If you steal your way into this country and you sign up for benefits and you get health care and you get education and you get this and you get that, you're a crook. Oh, you yeah. are a thief. Yeah, and I have friends all over the world. I'm at home wherever I go. I love people from all over the world. I even love our enemies. But that doesn't mean that I don't close the door and lock it at night. No. I don't invite everybody to come in and ravage my family and steal from my home. But... Uh, the way to come in is with the welcome, and the welcome is through the legitimate immigration process. And that's, that's one of the situations that America says is not fair. You know, we, we should not have people stealing into the country. And I, and I think these are the kind of things we're going to have to have really um, intelligent discussions across. To George W. Bush's um, credit, he took his second term, and he used up a good bit of his political capital trying to accomplish um, immigration reform and the left and nobody could do it nobody would do it because the right says secure the border and then we'll take a look at how we deal with everybody who's here legally and everything else the left says um, well we want to deal with all that make sure we could keep all the people in before we even start to secure it Ronald Reagan tried this they promised they were going to secure the border back in the first years of his presidency it's still not done What's, what, what, what is, what's behind the, the left's immigration policies? I mean, wh wh who, why, what, what, what's, what are they, how are they benefiting? Well, the way, the way that they think they're benefiting is they think that if you have, um, they're, they're losing the argument, they're losing the country, they've lost the populace of the country, 
they have these little urban centers. And they think that if you bring in uh, 10, 12, 14, 20 million people um, who are going to gravitate to the centers, it's going to empower them politically. So, so that's the only reason. It, it, uh, there, it's simply, it's simply going to empower their there, political... There's no, there's no sense that uh, their calculus has anything to, to do with anything except, Other than their power. except to build up their perception of power. Now, the irony is is that uh, amongst Hispanics who are here, Donald Trump had one of the highest votes, uh, just a few points under George Bush's. And I, I think one of the things that we're going to see is that, um, you, know, I, you know, yes, I'm Irish by my heritage, but I'm an American. And that's still something that means something to me. And I have friends who come from all over the world, and they are, they've become naturalized citizens, many of them. And they consider themselves American first and what they were before, what their heritage is second. And that's the real America. The real America is the melting pot. Um, my friends who are Italian, who are German and Polish and Slovakian and that who came, they came here to add something to the American pie, not to grab their slice and run off. And this is a case Because they where, came to believe in it. Yes. Well, they, they wanted to be part of it. They said, man, this is a team that I want to be a part of. I believe in the opportunity there, and I'm proud to be an American. I, I have a, a, a young friend, uh, one of my son's friends, um, who is here for many years and has gone through the process. He's from Mexico and who recently uh, became an American citizen, became a naturalized American citizen. And, uh, you know, uh, and then I saw Republicans out saying, get out, get out. No, I never saw that. I never saw that at all. In fact, all the conservatives I know took them under wing and said, yay. I, I brought them to, to one of the uh, Republican meetings and everybody there in the room cheered him and embraced him. Simply because he went through the legal process. Yes. Which, which they, all our great grandfathers did and, too. And they, and they loved him just like America, you know, has come to love all of our immigrants. Look, when, when, when you know, my ancestors came, uh, it wasn't a good spot. Uh, when you landed, if you were Irish, no, Irish no. need not apply the sign said, pictured us as monkeys. There was this, there was that. I mean, we went through a tremendous difficult time. What did we do? We used our rights to come together as a community. And then we, we, we integrated, we amalgamated into the United States. Now, you know, there's history books about, you know, how many people of Irish descent have, you know, made an impact as there are with Italians and as there are um, with all the other legitimate you know, immigrants who've come in. Um, you know, the, the first Hispanic attorney general was appointed by George Bush. I mean, you know, we're in, this, we're in this situation where we've got to remember that what we're about in America is bigger than identity politics. It's bigger than one little sliver. It's bigger than uh, some micro minority yelling in the corner and having a tantrum because they can't get their own way. Well, organize and win the majority then you can get your own way. And if you can't do that, you're not going to legislate through the courts. And that's why it's so important that, like, for example, when you look at the domestic policy, probably one of the most important legacies that Donald Trump is going to have is that he has already held the Supreme Court with the appointment of Gorsuch. And, and just parenthetically, you know, we are, um, by history, uh, a Christian Protestant nation. And our Supreme Court, until Gorsuch was appointed, was um, six Catholics and three people of Jewish descent. Mm -hmm. That might have been a problem with why a, a, uh, a Protestant Christian public feels estranged from the left-leaning decisions this court's been making for years on major issues. Well, they should feel estranged. And so, you know, we're, we're now hearing that maybe uh, Justice Kennedy's about ready to stand down. We don't have a 5-4 conservative court. Um, we do on certain issues, but we really have a 5-4 liberal court on others. So we have about right a, now. Right now, we have about a four and a half, four and a half. Uh, Kennedy has been going both directions. Yeah, because he goes liberal on social issues. He goes conservative on some of the others. But uh, if we get a second appointment, and, we, and I, I would not say Gorsuch is a, a Scalia. Not, not, I wouldn't say that. But, no, I, but I would say he's a thoughtful, prudent, conservative jurist. But I think that, you know, the next appointment 
um, you know, could change the direction of the country and save the culture for maybe two generations. And if he gets a third or fourth, Donald Trump is going to uh, preserve the future of the country. Number one, not by putting conservatives over liberals, but by putting constructionists, strict constructionists, who want to follow the way the Constitution was written, what the intention of the founders was. You know, in the scriptures it says you can't change the foundations. Right. You know, if you change the foundation of something, you're, all, you're, you're arguing against your own foundations, you're going to collapse. No, just, just for, the, for the record, you know my position is that I'm really upset that the Constitution doesn't mention God. So that I don't really believe that even if they're strict constitutionalists, that the Constitution itself has enough in it to preserve us. I do believe the church mm -hmm. is ordained to be the preserver. And if the church gets too worldly, they yeah. can't preserve the culture. I mean, don't you think that only Christianity can really preserve yeah, I, 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 I do believe that. And I think, you know, Martin Luther King uh, said it this way. And I, I thought he said it uh, extremely well when he said the church is not the king of the state or the slave of the state. The church is to be the conscience of the state. And I believe that the purpose of the church is to bring the presence of faith and righteousness into the town square, into the body politic, into the community. Look, when, when I grew up, the, the church and the state and the school and the micro community and the neighborhood and the parents. They were all, it, it, they it all was, worked it together. Was, it was pretty close. I mean, I could get in trouble two blocks away and, and get a couple of spankings by the neighbors. But I, by the time I got home and then get in trouble again for getting in trouble with the neighbors. I mean, it was a pretty cohesive world. And uh, I, I don't know that it takes a uh, village to raise a child, but it, it, it can take a task force of neighbors. So the thing, the thing that I'm saying is that uh, we have watched our institutions starting to crumble. Look, there's, there's three lenses that produce justice in America. Uh, the first concept is legality. We have laws. It goes all the way back to the Ten Commandments. It comes forward through uh, English common law and, uh, and from the Magna Carta on in English common law. And, and it's brought together in our Constitution and then in all the laws we pass. And that's legality. But there's something else we have. We have the lens of ethics. And ethics is the application of morality. But don't forget that our Supreme Court outlaws the Ten Commandments in the public school. See, well, so that th this, these, is one, these... this is one of the problems we have. You have the morality is the second lens and ethics is applied morality, which is the third lens that produces justice. If you take out morality, ethics is meaningless because you're well, applying... If you, 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 you redefine the traditional definition of morality. If you, it, it, which is the same as throwing that lens out. Yes. Because we're, our lens, our morality lens in America is the Judeo-Christian ethic. So much so that when this was debated in the early Supreme Court, they stopped short of saying we're a Christian nation, but they said we prefer Christianity. This nation prefers Christianity. Why? Uh, 50 out of the 52 signers of the Constitution were strong members of their local church. Uh, when the study was done to see what was the main uh, driving influence of the founders, I think it was Harvard who did the study, and they looked at their entire body of work, and 40% of their entire body of work were quotations from the Old and New Testament of the, uh, of the Bible. So that's our foundation. If we toss that to the side, Ethics has no meaning because we all have our own ethics. Yeah, if, if the definition of morality is not based on that, and yeah. it's based on a new, de new, new definition of morality, right? like equality is the new morality. Or, or, like, or like this idea that um, many of the speakers on the left have, this is a living, breathing document. All that means is they get to change it, and I disagree with that. Based on the latest fashion. Yeah. And, and this is what we know in the scriptures. This is one of the wisdoms we have from history that when everybody does what's right in their own eyes, that means there is no collective morality. That means people are adrift. So you have anarchy. Yeah, you have anarchy. That's exactly what and it means An anarchist is a big movement today. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things we look at, so, you know, you think about how, where does Trump fit into this? Trump is not a conservative ideologue. He is a conservative. Which Reagan kind yeah. of was. Yeah. Reagan kind of was, but Reagan was also pragmatic. Yeah. I mean, he, he was pragmatic too, and that's the thing where... Um, I think Trump and Reagan are going to have many comparisons uh, when, you know, the histories are written. And I, I say that, you know, uh, w with a, a certain amount of pause just because we're three months into what I hope is 16 years of conservative rule. The second uh, Trump administration, I'd be very pleased to see our vice president ascend to the presidency for another two terms. 
And this 16 years could be the, the most formative and the most important in our history because we've never had a debt this large. Nobody in the history of the world has ever had a debt this large that they had to overcome. Nobody's ever had such an anemic, we have not had such an anemic economy, uh, you know, really uh, since we saw our whole economy fall in the depression. And uh, this idea that, oh, you know, we're at full, uh, you know, employment or they're close to it or within a few percent when we have 94 million people out of the workforce during the Obama years, um, you know, is just total nonsense. That's why when Trump started talking to the coal miners in West Virginia and to what was happening with the blue collar workers in Pennsylvania and Michigan and Ohio, they finally felt like somebody was listening to them. Everybody kept telling them. I don't know what's wrong with you. Your life is great. And they said, well, because our town's closing down, we don't have any jobs. Our health care doesn't work. Obamacare's junk. It costs thousands of dollars in premium. Then it costs thousands of dollars in deductible. And the average person can't use it, even if you give them a nice little red, white, and blue card. The only people who really benefited in that deal were the free users, the Medicaid. And they thought that was great. But that's all that really happened. There was 13 million people who got added to the Medicaid rolls. So that turned that into a new burgeoning program, and they stole $750 billion out of Medicare. So, you know, when we look at this, that's why the American people are saying, hey, we want this done. So we saw what, what happened in Washington with the first attempt at taking apart Obamacare. Forty-two times Republican Congress voted, hey, we're getting rid of this thing, getting rid of this thing. And we said, okay, now you got to get rid of it. And it, it's like Paul Ryan and a lot of the other uh, establishment conservatives who didn't, who fought against Trump, tried to, you know, sabotage his campaign, did everything they could to keep him from being there, thought, okay, well, we'll just use Trump and we'll do Ryan Care and we'll just stick Trump's name on it and see if we can co opt him. Guess what? It didn't work. Because the people who supported Trump will not support Paul Ryan. And the people who supported uh, Trump are not going to let him be co opted. And he won't let himself be co opted. So they had to come back at this. You know, are we going to have a full repeal? That's, that's a technical thing. Of course, we'll have a repeal, and of course, we'll have a replacement. There, it's not that there are everything in Obamacare is bad. Um, the one thing that they all failed to do that should have been done was to open up across state lines and bring the pooling together. The Democrats and Republicans, everybody in Congress, everybody in the country knows, everybody in business knows, Obama knew that was the way you fix this health care crisis. But he wanted single payer health system. He wants socialized health care. Mm -hmm. He wants the health care that people travel to this country when they have it for free in another country, but it takes them six months to get a life saving operation. They come here and pay out of their pocket. Like Canada. Yeah, like Canada and, and like certain parts of Europe. So, you know, and, and we're, we're not a city state. We're not one of these little European countries. You know, we don't want to pay 60, 70% of our dollar, you know, uh, and, and be taken care of from cradle to grave. We live in the rural America, Trump nation, that big red, you know, Trump nation from coast to coast. We live independently. We take care of ourselves. We, we supply our own security in a lot of ways. We're, we get things done. We don't want the government coming in and subjugating us through tax policies. Um, we only got four minutes left. Yep. Now, you know, I've been a little, especially because of the Syria thing, I've been real <laughs> negative on Trump on, that, on some of those points. Uh, if you could take the other side, I mean, you're, you're trying to, be positive, which we, mm -hmm. we should try, as a Christian, you should try to be positive. Mm -hmm. But what are some negatives? Are you, are you able to see any negatives? Can you identify with some of the critiques at all? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you, I, mean, I think that if that's, I think most of the critiques are overstated and they're, they're hand wringing, they're, they're chicken little, and, and they have failed to understand that Trump is going to continue what he's good at, which is the art of the deal, which is reach for more than you can get so that you have something to give back to get what you need to get. And he's gonna to continue to do that. And it doesn't matter if everybody throws tantrums about that or what. I think one of the things I would say to the left is, um, it, and we see, some, we see some hints of this. Uh, it was suggested maybe that the Democratic Party should make an acid test that uh, you're not pro-life, that you only believe in abortion or you're not a Democrat. Yeah, that is kind of really and, ridiculous. And Nancy, Nancy Pelosi, who's been you know, laughable in claiming that in her faith, Catholicism, which is like, you know, the great stop against abortion, that abortion is moral. She's argued, she's argued that. But when it came and they said, well, let's make that an acid test. If you're in the Democratic Party, you just have to believe in abortion. 
I don't think that's such a good idea. She backed off. She backed off of that. And I think what 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 some of the left is seeing is, look, and, I, and I've heard uh, liberal news commentators and others say, you know, uh, the left, the Democrats, the progressive has gone too far to the left on the social issues, and they've left America behind. America's not going there. Yeah. Blue collar America is not going there. It doesn't matter if you're white, Hispanic, where you are. So I think, like, you know, one of the things I would say is the big question is where do we go from here? Okay. You know, we look at where do we go from here. Um, I think we're in the first four months of the next 16 years. So I want to say to uh, all of my Christian and conservative friends, and especially, um, you know, some of my friends who, who are more in Rand Paul's camp, um, keep your powder dry. Uh, we're not engaging in a bunch of wars. The only thing that we're going to do in foreign policy is that we are going to act now, and that's going to act as a deterrent. This is a peace through strength um, you know, strategy, just like Reagan did, and it was extraordinarily successful. On the home front, um, we've, we've got to replace Obamacare and get the mandate gone, and we've got to open up across state lines. We've got to let market forces push this down. We're still going to lose a lot of people with catastrophic needs out the bottom. We're going to have six or seven million that we're going to have to be generous with. Um, we're, we're going to have to redo our, our taxes. We've got to make this a place where business can function and the corporate tax rate has to come down. So we're going to see a lot of positive things, you know, that are happening. But I'm just saying, hey, hold on. We're, we're four months into 16 years. Okay. Um, we're pretty much done here. <laughs> uh, well, I think it's good to be positive. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm, I, could, I mean, I brought all this negative stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm reading guys that are really negative. And I like to know the negative, okay? I think because, we should. Because if we should know. listen to each other's arguments. We should have them. Right. But you're giving a pretty positive and... Um, which is good. I mean, I, Can, is, is it apparent that I'm happy? <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully when uh, Mike Pence comes to speak in Notre Dame, maybe you can, you know, see him. Uh, but it's good that we have somebody here locally yeah. that is connected. Not everybody is. Yeah. And you're bringing a report from kind of inside. And um, that's good. And uh, we're closing up here on Citizens for Community Media with uh, Patrick Mangan. Hopefully this was helpful for our community here and of course this goes YouTube and uh, so until next time um, Peter Hill and Pat Mangan.